Hi, I'm Catherine. And I'm Teresa. And we are the co-authors of the book, Pass the Baton, Empowering All Music Students. Our goal is to share stories of educators who are passing the baton and empowering their music students. We want to help teachers create music lessons that transform students from passive consumers to vibrant creatives. Welcome back to the Pass the Baton podcast. We're here to talk about all things student empowerment and music education. Before we introduce today's guest, we want to remind you to follow or subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. In addition, if you like what you hear today, please consider leaving a rating or review. That's what helps podcasts like Pass the Baton grow. Well, here we are officially in season two. (laughs) I know. I know. It's been a fun summer recording episodes and and, oh my goodness, the stuff that we have coming up is, is really awesome. And today's guest is... It, you know, <laughs> is no exception. Um, we're really thrilled to be talking today. We talked with Dr. Matthew Aral. Catherine, what'd you think? I mean, it's wonderful. I have uh, a new book to read like yep. tonight. <laughs> or when, my, when it comes, <laughs> I, I have it in my Amazon cart. Um, yeah, just so wonderful. So I just love the idea of, you know, cultivating positivity, positivity in your um in your culture and your band room and your music yeah. room and like just lifting people up. Like, I just still yes. can't get past what he said about that. Like, it's just like, I, who doesn't want to belong in a place mm-hmm. that's like that? Absolutely. And when our students have those feelings, they're more likely to stick with it. They're more likely to, to continue their music making. And that's, yeah. that's always our goal. Yeah. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We are so happy to have you here, and we are really excited about today's guest, Dr. Matthew Arau. I actually had the pleasure of meeting Matthew briefly at Midwest, and since then have been reading his book and just following his work, and we're we're so excited to have you. So welcome. Thanks for being here. It is a thrill to be here. I'm so glad to get to join the two of you, and uh, I'm a big fan of, of your work. Of <laughs> uh, fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic work. Yeah. So. Thanks so here. much. So um, before we kind of get into the the meat of this, can you tell us a little about yourself, your background, what, where you're teaching, things like that? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently a professor of music at uh, Lawrence University Conservatory in Appleton, Wisconsin. And I'm, I'm from California originally, grew up in Los Angeles area in Sacramento, went to Lawrence University in Wisconsin for undergrad. And then I became a music teacher in Colorado. In Loveland, Colorado, I got to teach middle school band for eight years at Walt Clark Middle School and then moved over to the high school, Loveland High School, for seven more years. So I got to teach 15 years in the public schools, loved every minute of it, loved every grade <laughs> level. And then I pursued my doctorate in conducting at University of Colorado Boulder. Also uh, earned a master's degree from the American Band College uh, along the way. And uh, then I got invited to be the associate band director and chair of music education at Lawrence University in 2014. So I just finished my eighth year of teaching at the college level and excited to begin the ninth. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And in addition, uh, I have a great passion for, for student leadership and, and for mindfulness and, and mindset and, and building uh, cultures, uh, positive, compassionate cultures. And during the pandemic, I actually wrote uh, a book, a new book called <laughs> Upbeat. <laughs> And uh, you can see this is my own personal copy. It's like quite used now, but uh, so, and we'll dive into these topics, I think a little bit during our discussion today, but I, but I wrote it for teachers and um, it's definitely moved uh, through my own personal experience in the pandemic. And I hope that this serves folks who, who have a chance to check it out as upbeat mindset, mindfulness, and leadership in music education and beyond. Yeah. People should definitely check it out for sure. Oh, yes. (laughs) As I said before, I have it in my in my or in my um, cart, ready to go. Can't wait. <laughs> but so I know you kind of brought up a little few of those points already. But like, where did you get the interest in mindset, leadership, and program culture? Yeah, so I know it's a it's a, it's a lot to to mm-hmm. bring together. And uh, when I was a high school band director, I started a leadership program for my students called the Leadership Symposium, and. I always say I started this leadership program out of survival, (laughs) right? We had, we had some major cultural challenges. I was following a super successful band director. uh, And so we, we we had some cultural issues just from, from the inside out. And 
fortunately, a couple of my students came to talk to me about it. They said, look, we, we trust you, but what can we do to, to really lift the program up? And we started meeting after school once a week, uh, second semester. And we asked questions, you know, what kind of band do you want to create? You know, what do we want members of the band to be known for? What, what is our reputation? What character qualities do we want to have? And we studied uh, leadership works such as The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell, and uh, all of John Wooden's works, particularly on leadership, co-authored by Steve Jameson. So we had some culture curriculum ideas to, to get started, to begin the conversation. We drew on Tim Lotzenheiser's amazing work on student leadership and, and particularly servant leadership. And over a, a shorter amount of time than you'd expect, we were able to transform the culture into something really positive, supportive, and encouraging. And my students, in collaboration with me, define leadership as leadership is inspiring and encouraging others to achieve their full potential. The Leadership Symposium is something that we continued throughout my time at Loveland, and I'm really excited to share that the, the band director who followed me, Kyle Friesen, continues it to this day. And so it's been going on for like 10 years after I left. It's still been uh, in existence. And after I left Loveland, folks started asking me to to help them with cultural and leadership challenges. So I was able to to work with programs uh, in the beginning in Colorado. I presented at our Colorado State Conference in January 2014, and then fortunately in December 2014, I was uh, able to present at the Midwest Clinic. And the clinic was titled "Leadership Matters: Enhance Your Music Program Through Effective Student Leadership." And that led to being invited to join the Conselmer Education Clinician faculty. Dr. Tim invited me to join them. And then I started presenting through CSI. And then it just kind of started exploding. And uh, now I have my own company called Upbeat Global. And where we, we focus, uh, our vision is to inspire positivity through leadership and music around the world. And so it's been exciting. Um, now at this time, I've presented in over 25 states and four continents on mindset, mindfulness, leadership, and culture. And uh, yeah, we can go deeper into the other aspects uh, of mindfulness, but I'll kick it back over to you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's that's awesome. I love the couple things that really stuck out. First of all, that the students came to you and that they yeah. trusted you enough to say like, this is something that, that we're noticing and we want to work on. So that's awesome. And we'll, you know, we'll probably talk more about those relationships later, <laughs> but I, I love that idea. And that, that you took that and invited them into the process. It wasn't like, okay, let me fix this. You know, let me <laughs> as band director, you know, head of, head of everything, let me fix this. You, you invited them to be part of the process. And I think that's, you know, what we, what Catherine and I really resonated with your work was that it, it was, it was an us. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't me. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't your program. You recognized that it was all of yours and it was something you had to do together. That's so true. I still remember the moment. It was Greg and Brad, two trombone players, uh -huh. a junior and sophomore, and, and they happened to be section leaders. And uh, they were proactive and took the initiative to reach out. And our first session where we met with the students, we watched a five, 10 minute clip of Dr. Tim talking to students about servant leadership. And that concept of servant leadership was so different from the type of leadership that had, was running in the program, which was more about the best players become the leader. The drum majors get sent to a leadership camp and that's pretty much it. And there isn't that coaching along the way to support students that are leaders. And when we introduce this concept that leadership is about lifting others and, and it's not about power, it's not about authority, it's about how can you serve others, that was a big revelation for our students and that led to all these questions. And I guess I would just share that if teachers are listening to this and you decide you want to meet with your students about what kind of program do you want to create, spend more time listening than speaking. I would basically maybe ask a question and then I was silent for the next 15 minutes as the students self-led the conversation. And the, we did have a student taking notes along the way so that it could be recorded and shared for the students or with the students that couldn't attend. Yeah. That there's can be so, so much, hard for us. I know. and it, But there's so much power in just listening. I mean, just listen and soak it all in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I just, I, you can picture like that uncomfortable silence for a moment, but if you can just get through that, right. Mm -hmm. Then they probably, they take over. Yeah. And, and, and in the book and in chapter eight, there's a series of questions as suggestions, you know, like what kind of traditions do you want to create? What do you want to be known for? You know, what does excellence mean to you? And then there was even the question, you know, what would it look like if every student in the band was a leader? Which, by the way, that came from a tuba player, Mindy. She, we were talking about what leadership is, and she said, "Well, what would it look like if every person in the band was a leader?" And then we started discussing. Well, I guess it depends on how you define leadership, and and that led to this whole idea that leadership isn't about the title; it's about who you are and how you act and how you give, and that leadership can be learned. Some folks think that leadership is a quality that you're born with. And, and I like to share, you know, leadership can be learned and leadership can be taught, which is a really important principle, I think. Yeah. So in our, you know, in our world, we're, we talk a lot about the student ownership piece, right? The student empowerment. How are we giving them agency and all of that? And again, that's why we were so interested in talking to you, because what you're describing is giving students ownership of this program. So can you talk to us about, you know, how are we going, to, how can we as band directors, orchestra, chorus, all of the things, create this culture at the beginning of the year that that really supports student ownership and really encourages students to to be part of it and not just, you know, sitting on the sidelines. Right. Well, it is a very exciting prospect to to hand over or to give more voice to our students, particularly as band directors or orchestra directors or choir directors, even the way the room is set up is designed mm -hmm. by the teacher to be up front and to lead. And certainly we do have the degrees in music, right? There's that, <laughs> right? And so we have all that. We have all this we want to offer. And our role models have mo yeah. more often than not been, you know, the the sage on the stage, the, the, the one, you know, giving the information and, and being the conductor and all of that. And, and that's, you know, that's still going to be part of it. There's still going to be often the concert that's conducted by us, although we can have student-led concerts, which is amazing. Um, but I found that once I ask students questions or bring, I love bringing students up to the front of the room to, to listen and offer what they hear or share what they hear. Every time I'm completely blown away. <laughs> right. And I've even done this in conferences in, in Colorado. Uh, it was, uh, it would have been January, 2020. Uh, it was a rehearsal lab and we had a junior high band. And I even shared with the audience before it happened. I said, we're going to bring some students up here. And I bet you're going to be completely blown away by what they have to share. And I remember some students came up front and they started sharing what they were hearing musically. And it was so advanced <laughs> that all of us in the audience, we had our jaws dropped. It was like, <laughs> we were thinking to ourselves quietly, like, I don't know if I heard that myself. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when we empower students, it's really powerful. But the beginning of the year is a fabulous time to collaborate with your students to create a vision, a vision together. And there's no time like the beginning of the year to open that dialogue with our students, you know, and, and, and I like to share, you know, let's start off with a list of values and priorities, like what matters to us? You know, why are we here? What's our purpose? And make that about the students and, and be open to, to what they share and maybe bring a student up to the front to be a scribe to write on the whiteboard or on, on poster boards, keeping a long list of what are we about? And then talking about, okay, well, what's the, you know, the, the mile high view of this? You know, if you're at the top of the mountain, what do you see? What's our big vision? And it's always fascinating to hear what students have to say. Um, and so I think we can create a vision ourselves as a teacher and present it and then motivate and, and, and go and say like, yeah, this is an incredible vision and get everybody on board. Or we can do the opposite and flip it around and say, what's important to you? What do you want to achieve this year? Mm -hmm. And then work together. Cause I think there needs to be teacher voice and student voice. So I don't think that student voice means giving everything away. Mm -hmm. right? And I always share with teachers that are developing visions you're going to be here longer than the students, right? Mm -hmm. Often. And so you need to also believe in the vision. But when you have student involvement, there's so much more buy-in. And even the process of working together starts transforming the culture, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It does. I was going to say, I always, I always kind of see it as when I bring something to the group, I always have in my mind some must haves for myself. Like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to find, I don't know where this is going to go, but I do know that I need to have standards at the forefront or whatever it is that I know that I can live with, with the group and I'll share those with them. But then there's so much room to grow from there. It's not, those are just the three couple things that I know I need for myself, but then can identify all the different ways that they are going to help shape this as well. So I think that's great. I've worked with programs where the where the teacher's done exactly that. They've actually given like three words recently. I worked with the program and, and the teacher said, okay, folks, I want to include something about excellence, uh-huh. musicianship, and community. Yeah. And they didn't even have to use the specific words, but something that related to excellence, musicianship, and community. And then it went from there for the students uh, talking about what was important and the we broke the the band in this case into smaller groups. So the students collaborated, they, they came up with their own ideas and then all the groups presented their, their group ideas. And then the students would see what resonated with them. Then they'd go back to their original group and take everyone's ideas, almost start all over and then come up with their second draft and then present. And then at that point, usually there's some common themes. Mm-hmm. start to come come through and it's beautiful when students are using words like inclusion right or access or equity and 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 they're talking about collaboration and community and connection and caring and compassion and when these words are emanating from from the students i think it just is so powerful and meaningful and in a way it's reflective of the culture that the teacher has already created, right? They're starting to say like, we've noticed this in our program, but we want to make sure that, that we continue on that path forward. Yeah. Um, So I guess you kind of hinted on it, but like, so when you start to do these kinds of things with kids and you, you, you know, create your own vision together, what do you see what what's the benefits from the students? Like how is it how does it look different from when you started and the culture was not was not where it needed to be? What's the difference that you see? <laughs> it's it's been massive, actually. Yeah, I bet. It's been massive. And, and I sometimes it's shocking to students if you haven't had a collaborative culture beforehand, mm-hmm. right? All of a sudden the students there might even be this barrier of, of trust saying, mm-hmm. like, you really do you really want to know what we have to say? <laughs> By the way, be prepared. <laughs> right? You have to be be ready. And, and one of the, the ways to, to get at it actually is to share with students, like, it's okay to talk about things that, that we're not doing super well. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. And I actually play this game I'll, I'll share with, with you. I call, uh, well, the theme is how we throw the ball affects how the ball is received. And and I and you can play this game with your students. Uh, and I'll kind of show you here on the video. Is I always start off with this imaginary prop, <laughs> and I'll and before I begin, I'll say to students, "Can we agree that as musicians and and leaders that we tend to be creative?" <laughs> Most people raise their hand. Yeah, we tend to be. And then I say, "Can you agree that we tend to be solution finders? Like we're focusing on what we want to create rather than what's wrong." And mm-hmm. I think that's a really important aspect. Uh, let's particularly creating a vision. It's so easy to go down that negative rabbit hole and be like, we, you come up with a series of negatives. We don't want this. We don't want that. We don't want that. I would share it. Let's move away from that and let's move towards what we do want. Yeah. And so that's really important. And so be, before I begin this creative game with students, I get them in that mindset. And I'll say, I want you to think outside of the box. Let's get outside of our comfort zone. However, this begins is not how it needs to end. So it's really important in the brainstorming process to get in that positive frame of mind of anything is possible. So many folks will put the barrier on themselves, say, oh, we've never done that before, so we can't do it. I, I say the past is the past. Let's create the present and the future now. And so what I'll do is I'll I'll begin and, and, and I'll just throw this imaginary ball and maybe start off like I'm playing basketball, like dribbling the ball, as you can see on the video. And then I'll pass the ball to a student and they'll, they'll catch it. And they'll often start passing this imaginary ball around. And then a creative student will transform the ball into maybe like a Frisbee or a football, <laughs> right? 
or uh, bowling, which is always fun, right? Or volleyball. <laughs> and then somebody really breaks out of the box and then they, they move e even away from this ball idea and it can be anything, right? So somebody will turn it into a sandwich and they pass the sandwich on because they're <laughs> super generous, right? Somebody will turn it into water and, you know, pass some water to somebody. And, you know, they, they might even turn it into like a kitten or something, although you shouldn't throw the kitten. Anyways, uh, <laughs> What the, and and then I'll share with students like, oh, you could even turn it into a big beach ball and I'll, and I'll start making like a big air pump, right? And blow the ball up to this giant ball and then I'll throw it super slowly, right? And then everybody catches it slowly. And what I share is that if somebody throws the ball at you really quickly, you have to catch it quickly. If somebody throws a ball at you slowly, how do you catch it? Naturally, you catch it slowly. And this teaches a really important theme for leadership and really for our culture, which is how we throw the ball affects how the ball is received. How we communicate affects how others respond to us. How we lead is going to affect how others are going to want to work alongside us. And so this then leads to a question for the students, which is, how are we throwing the ball? How are we throwing the ball as students? How are we throwing the ball as a class? If you have multiple grade levels in your ensemble, how are the older students throwing the ball to the new students or the younger students? And that's led to some really beautiful, I guess, revelations and conversations. And, and, and it's also revealed things. I think part of this creating culture we want, we have to look, we have to look under. <laughs> you know, the, the layers, right? Behind closed doors, what, what else, what's really going on? And sometimes you'll find out, uh, you know, things that, you know, disappoint or make you sad, such as a, a freshman saying, I don't think my section leader knew my name mm. the entire marching band season. Um, and, and so kind of revealing that or, or I didn't feel like I was welcomed. In fact, I thought about quitting every day because I didn't feel like I belonged. So that could be on the list of maybe we're not throwing the ball super well. And then on, then you have another list on how are we throwing the ball well? And there might be things like, well, we play great music or, you know, we, we have a lot of pride in, in pet band in, in the stands. And that's great. So then we think about how can we take the things that we're not doing well and turn those into the positive column. And that also makes the vision and, and creating the vision and mission for your group more relevant to the students and saying, hey, we're acknowledging these challenges and struggles that we're having, but we're going to work this year to convert those into positives. Yeah. yeah. That's such a good mindset to have and just a good way to, I can see how everybody would, would feel like they're part of it, right? You're making this an environment where everyone feels included. And, and I'm sure we know like kids who feel included are going to continue doing what they're doing. They're going to stay in band. They're going to continue as musicians. Do you see it? kind of carrying with them beyond the classroom as well? Like, like, do you notice any of that? Well, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, you know, this is, this is a, probably one of our goals as music teachers, right? Is to teach, to teach character, to teach life through the vehicle of music mm -hmm. so that the skills they learn in music class, for example, teamwork, leadership, uh, empowerment, believing in yourself, growth mindset. Uh, if you're integrating mindfulness into your classroom, mindfulness practices, if you're integrating SEL, how can you take the, you know, connecting to yourself emotionally, mentally and emotionally, how can you take that beyond? Those are certainly goals we have in music classes. And that's that's been phenomenal to get feedback from students that have graduated and gone on to careers and shared how this focus in the music classroom was maybe the most important thing they ever learned mm -hmm. and has helped them be successful. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. And folks will say that music teaches certain things and we'll rattle off a whole bunch of things like music helps in this, these areas. And I actually have to counter that and say, not necessarily. <laughs> I say that not necessarily like music will make people good people. And I say, really? Not necessarily. Music will make someone a good leader. I'll say, really? Not necessarily. Music teaches teamwork. I'm like, not always, which might be counter to what a lot of folks like to say, but I would share that it depends on your intention as a music teacher and how you teach. Mm -hmm. Music won't necessarily teach teamwork unless you're intentional about creating teams and operating in teams. 
music won't teach effective leadership skills if you don't give students the opportunity to be empowered and have a voice. And music certainly, the way we've taught it traditionally, doesn't necessarily teach creativity either, right? And I think our goal is to have lifelong musicians that can create music on their own beyond school. But unless we make creativity and creating original you know, sources of music part of our classroom, then we're not necessarily teaching creativity. It's creative for the conductor. And as, actually, I, I feel like I'm almost quoting you from your book. <laughs> As, as you share that idea, and, uh, and I've, I've thought about that uh, for, for many years, that it's, it's, it's wonderful to be an interpreter as a conductor, but it's even better when we empower our students to be interpreters. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just involved in a Facebook discussion on that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, because you're, you're right. So often it's the, the director who's making all those creative decisions, who's really being the musical one. But we have to give the kids those opportunities. Otherwise, they're just recreating someone else's work. And not to discount that, right? It's not to discount the idea of trying to emulate other wonderful musicians. But those yeah. creative decisions are so important. And one of the ways I have I empower students within a rehearsal, and this is something you can uh, our listeners can do right away, is instead of us feeling like we have to have the solution or the answer immediately, pausing for a moment and having the students make small chamber groups. I always say, this is one of my tricks, I'll say, get in trios and quartets and discuss, right? <laughs> get in trios and quartets. It's always fun, like groups of three and four. But I always say, like, duets, trios, trios, quartets, and discuss what you heard and what you think could be improved. Yeah. All of a sudden they're listening more deeply. Now, maybe the, maybe you do this the first time. They're like, I didn't hear a thing. I wasn't actually listening. Cause I didn't think I should be called on. So then you're like, okay, let's try that again. Knowing that you're going to be getting in groups. Let's play that again. And I want you to focus on, and we c- can always direct the listening, right? We could say, let's, let's focus on what you heard in terms of balance or focus on intonation. We can certainly direct the listening. But as we, as our students get more experience, uh, we can just certainly say, you know, what did you hear and, and share it out and what are solutions? This is a, a really important, I think, is it's, it's easier for us to point out what's wrong. It's more difficult for us to offer solutions. But when we get into that solution level, that's that critical thing. That's that higher level thinking. And that's really what we want to offer as educators too, is what are solutions? How many times... As educators, do you think that we we go into rehearsal and we're, and our plan is well? I'm just going to listen for the mistakes and identify the mistakes, mm-hmm. right? We become uh, a fix it. That's that's yeah. our mentality. We'll fix it. Now I always share with young teachers and and my music education students. What are you going to do when all the notes, <laughs> rhythms, <laughs> dynamics are perfect? And of course, people say, well, they'll never be. And I said, well, what if they are? What if they are? What, what comes next? You know, and um, so that, that whole idea of getting to that higher level of, you know, what's the music behind it? What's the expression behind it? A wonderful thing to engage our students with is emotion within rehearsal. And, you know, there's a, let's see, up to my side here, I think I have a, as I disappear off the screen, here's a great <laughs> book I actually recommend to teachers. It's called Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett. And he shares that in education, this isn't for music teachers, it's for all teachers. He shares that we often don't provide space for students to share their emotions and feelings in school. And that's unfortunate because uh, the ability to regulate our emotions Mm -hmm. and emotional intelligence um, has become one of the most important factors for happiness, fulfillment, and and ultimately success in life. And when I read Permission to Feel, and I talk about this in Upbeat, my book, that we have the perfect space to create a place where there is permission to feel. Mm -hmm. And what Mark Brackett shares in his book is that we need to name it to tame it. And that unfortunately, most people can only list about seven to eight different feelings and emotions. Mm. But yet there's 
over 3,000 <laughs> words in the English language. Actually, more of those words uh, are for what the label was like negative or unwanted emotions, you know, as, as opposed to positive. That always kind of shows a bias in our language, um, even towards the negative. Um, however, once you can identify how you're truly feeling, that's a pathway to helping you, you regulate it. So you might think, I'm angry. And then as you get deeper into it, it might actually be that you're frustrated or you're really disappointed, but the only word you know to label it is angry. And then when you start working with it and how awesome if we could start talking about emotions and feelings through musical expression and choosing literature that allows us to go deep into those different feelings and to be okay with it, to literally be okay to talk about our feelings and how it relates to our life and, and to make expression of emotion, both verbally and through our instruments, just part of the, the music education experience. And in a way, that's another way to give our students voice is to share like what you're feeling is okay. And isn't it awesome to have music to express what you're feeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think sometimes we get stuck telling ourselves, well, we need to get all the notes and rhythms first. Then we can think about the expressive elements. We, you know, we need, all this has to happen first, then we can, but really the music is that emotion, that expression. Yeah. So can you, what's a, like, what's a tangible, like what would this look like in a rehearsal? Yeah, well, first of all, I'll, I'll share a, a story from, from Brian Valmage's composer. Brian Valmage just shared at the Western International Band Clinic years ago, I was sitting in on one of his clinics, and he said he, you know, he was brought in to be the guest conductor, you know, for for a concert. And he, this might have been like the day before the concert. He got to work with the band, and he started talking about the piece and, and what it was about. And he could tell the students were looking at him like they had no idea what he was talking about. And he's, he says to the band director, like, you read them the program notes, right? <laughs> and the band director said, oh, no, I was waiting for you to do that. <laughs> and Brian Bauman just was like, oh, no, like the whole experience is affected by what the piece is about. And that should be part of the process from day one. And that's always stuck with me is like begin with what the piece is about. If it tells a story, like, let's get into that story. If it doesn't have a story, let's create a story. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's work together with our, with the students and have our students create stories. I was working with this band in Michigan. I got to, uh, to do, it was fun because we had a leadership clinic. Plus I got to do a series of rehearsals and integrate leadership in the rehearsals. And one of the pieces uh, was about a, a kite fighting and it was influenced, I think, by Kite Runner, the, uh, the great book about kite fighting in Afghanistan. And the students ended up, we put them into groups and they made a play. Each group made their own play <laughs> to tell the story. And what was so cool is the students chose one of the plays. And in the end, they acted it out while they performed it in concert. <laughs> and so some of them were actors in the front, literally like acting. And then some of them were the musicians also stood up and, and played like, you know, their solos were, were acting part of it out. And so the students became part of the process. Now, there wasn't an exact, you know, play written um, for, for this piece, but it allowed students to, to get more personal with the piece and, and to dive into it. The other aspect I want to share is in my work with, with band directors, I'm on the conducting faculty of the American Band College. So I get to work uh, through the master's program coaching music educators. And sometimes I find that teachers struggle with tapping into their own emotions as a teacher and conductor. In fact, they, they tend to compartmentalize or separate. And I've had teachers say, I separate my personal life from my teaching life, which I respect that. But some folks have gone so far that they are afraid to show how they feel mm -hmm. for fear that there will be classroom management struggles or students won't respect them if they should they reveal their humanity or they've been hurt they've personally the teacher has been traumatized or hurt when showing emotions before which of course i honor that as well what i would share is that if we want our students to be expressive we want our students to be vulnerable and we want our students to tap into truly who they are as a human being and when we say play from the heart to truly mean play from the heart, we need to role model. What that means is we might need to go to a place that's a little uncomfortable for us 
and be vulnerable and get to that place where we share maybe about a, a loss we've experienced if, if maybe a piece of music is about loss and, and we can connect to that. And as, as I know, Teresa and Catherine, you know, when you go to that place and you show your humanity and you're vulnerable, it just opens up the floodgates of connection, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. With our students. And instead of being a classroom management challenge, it actually transforms the culture into one where we're together in this. And that's something I've been thinking about because of the pandemic. We've all been going through the pandemic mm-hmm. together. And so this is something that we we have something we can all relate to and connect to together. So rather than, you know, ign- not talking about it by bringing those feelings and emotions into the classroom, we've now found a common thread of mm-hmm. connection, which allows students now to be even more expressive, to feel like it's okay to be themselves. Now they have a safe place where everybody belongs. And as Brene Brown says, you know, uh, there's a difference between fitting in and belonging, right? She says, fitting in is changing who you are to, to fit in with the group. Whereas belonging is, I get to be me. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of classroom I want to create. Yeah. That makes sense. There was a, when I was teaching in the middle school, as we were getting ready to open the school, the, t- the principal had us all read this book. It's called Middle School, Belong and Become. Mm-hmm. And it was the idea with those students at that age that they need to find a way that they can both, you know, belong as who they are and become, oops, excuse me, become who they will become over the years. That's what middle school is all about, right? As we develop, <laughs> develop those, those young humans. Yeah, I, I love that. that. I love this idea of becoming. I, I share with students, oftentimes students, they, they start to identify that they are a certain way. Right. Mm-hmm. So maybe they had a day where they, 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 they really screwed up. They start to identify through self-talk. Well, that's just the way I am. And we use that. I'm, that's the way I am. And I share with students, it's a, it's a message that's been resonating a lot with students. I, I share who you were yesterday does not predetermine who you are today mm-hmm. or who you can become tomorrow. And that each day is an opportunity to choose opportunity to choose your character and who you want to be. You want to bring your best self today. And that sure, maybe yesterday wasn't your best. Maybe, maybe you were hangry. (laughs) I was like, who hasn't been hangry, right? (laughs) And we screwed up, right? But tomorrow's a a new day. And I think that's a really important lesson because as we start to, you know, label ourselves and say, this is just the way I am. That's really unfortunate. That puts us in that box, that fixed mindset. Um, but this idea that no, t- I can become, I can become who I aspire to be starting today. That's powerful. Very powerful. And for us to remember of our students too, just because you know, we can't label a student. Oh, that's just how they are. So glad you brought they're that still up. They're still on their, they're still on their journey, their path. Mm-hmm. So true. <laughs> so I think this is a great time to ask the question that we kind of ask everybody about um how do you how do you build relationships with your students um because i can tell because you know of this in culture that you create like relationships are going to be super important how you build those so any any ideas to offer the audience about how you build those relationships no i I i'm so glad you brought that up because it is so important to connect before we lead Mm -hmm. care before we critique and oftentimes we forget that mm-hmm. it's right into teaching mode. And it's like, well, we, we, we haven't built that, that caring connection yet. So that that's so important. I've discovered that if we're open and authentic and genuine regarding gratitude, and we bring gratitude intentionally into our teaching, we can begin to transform the culture and start to build deeper connections with our students. So I've made a point actually to begin every rehearsal, every class with sharing appreciation or gratitude for the students, even for the weather, (laughs) the space we get to be in, something that brings gratitude into the space. And it can be different every time. And the students don't even need to necessarily know that you're doing it, but you, you do. 
And then I like to bring mindful breathing into the classroom. And our students, you know, are going through so much and there's been so, there's so much stress and anxiety. When I ask students, how many of you experienced stress today? <laughs> Every hand goes up. How many of you have felt some anxiety? Every single hand goes up. By the way, it's the same answer with teachers, <laughs> <laughs> yes. right? And so um, I'll, I'll even share, you know, how many of you think it's important to treat others with kindness? Every hand goes up. How many of you believe it's important to treat others with compassion? Every hand goes up. How many of you believe it's important to find in your heart the ability to forgive others, even though it can be difficult? And every hand goes up. And then I said, how many of you, even though you know it's important to treat others with kindness, often don't extend that same kindness to yourself? Even though you know it's important to treat others with compassion, how many of you don't extend that same compassion to yourself? And even though you know it's important to forgive others, how many of you find the, the last person, the hardest person to forgive is you? And for those last three questions, every hand goes up. And when we know that, it's important for us to acknowledge that and to share with students that you're not alone and that we can begin to shift how we talk to ourselves. And so just getting in touch with how you talk to yourself is really important to start to shift the language. And through bringing in mindfulness into our classroom, students start to get become more self-aware. And so I'll often begin with just a, a deep, mindful breathing approach and uh, the focus breath is one that I use often. It's in your nose for four counts and out your nose for four counts. We'll do that three or four times. And that really uh, centers our students and focuses our students in. And I'll use this in transitions in between pieces. You can't talk when you're breathing through your nose. So <laughs> places, you don't need to say stop talking ever again. The rest of your career is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, but a breath that I want to bring us back to gratitude to create that culture of gratitude is the gratitude breath. And when you have your whole class breathing in for four counts, what they're grateful for in their nose, and then releasing out their mouth, any of that stress, toxic energy, any negativity, you just want to just let it go. You go eight counts out your mouth. And when we do that together three times, it's amazing how the, the feeling in the room changes. And I, I, I think mindfulness should be a centerpiece of all of our teaching because if students aren't in a place where they can learn, right, mm -hmm. where they have a, their amygdala is taken over because of all the stress and trauma, it's really shut down their executive functioning and their prefrontal cortex and neocortex. So, but mindful breathing can help us get to that centered place where we're now we can learn, we connect more with each other. Every aspect, you know, elevates our immune system, right? Our, our the positive energy that we have, our, our creativity elevates. Um, we're able to think more clearly when we're in, in this positive realm. And focusing on gratitude helps us to shift where, we, where we're feeling mentally and emotionally. Also, slowing down our breathing helps us get to that place. So I, I'm a huge advocate of, of using mindful breaths in the classroom. Of course, in Upbeat, we'll go into much more detail in, in my book about that. But I would share that as music teachers for years, <laughs> we've been saying, breathe together, come in together. Am I right? Right? <laughs> if this is ragged, we'll say, okay, watch me. Let's breathe together. <sighs> All of a sudden, it cleans up the entrance. Am I right? Yep. And what I've noticed, and this is something folks listening can do right away, is when we breathe together mindfully, we connect together. Mm-hmm. And we're actually designed biologically or physiologically for this. And so when we breathe slowly together, we breathe from our belly using our diaphragm, just mindfully breathing and students might gently close their eyes if, if they'd like to. You'll just notice the vibe in the room completely transform. And now you're ready to really connect to the heart. I mean, the heart, your heart rate slows down. And we're just in a, in a different place than we were the 60 seconds before breathing. Yeah. And so I found that that opens up the floodgates of connection. And then you can share, you know, what you're grateful for and then ask students to share, oh, what are you grateful for? And then maybe the first day one student shares and then the next day a few, and then you have students to share with each other and the sharing of gratitude changes the, 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 the vibe in the room. 
And then all of a sudden students become comfortable sharing appreciation in rehearsal. And ultimately I love to create what I call a culture of celebration. And oftentimes we have cultures that are <laughs> cultures of celebration. <laughs> hey, I'm coming to band class. I hope I don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's, it's about listening for the other folks in the group to find moments to celebrate them. And to uh, have a classroom where students just naturally shuffle their feet or snap when when mm. students do something special. And I'll share, you know, a uh, culture of celebration isn't just for the soloist, right? It's not just for those pinnacle summit moments. And it's not for just the concert. Sometimes going, oh, the concert, 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 concert. To me, I call it stepping stones of success. It's those daily, those, that daily progress is where the magic happens. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, those are, those are some thoughts. Yeah, like that's that. I do. I feel like then and kids feel seen, you know, on a on a daily basis too, yeah. right? For my lip, for my little success that we should be celebrating, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I used to do um, when I was teaching sixth grade band. We would do we called it three calming breaths. We did it because I I taught sixth grade band immediately after lunch, which if you know anything about eleven and twelve year olds. <laughs> Ooh, they're they're ready to go right after lunch. So, but it, it was great just for bringing us all to the same place. You know, everybody here we are. We're in our seats. Okay, you know, either look down, close your eyes. Let's do these three calming breaths together, and then we could start rehearsal. <laughs> because, but I I love the idea of of adding the gratitude piece to it. That's yeah. yeah. I think it, it goes without saying, but I, I think I should say it, which is to know our students. Mm -hmm. and to learn their names and how they want to be called and, you know, as, as pronouns um, and, but pronunciation matters so much. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes students will just accept it because their names always mispronounce and, and they'll say, Oh, that's fine. And I was like, no, I really want to, can mm -hmm. you really help me with this? Mm -hmm. And that's so important. And then going beyond the name. And, and, you know, and then some people will do like Google forms or whatnot to get to know their students. But the more we can show them, you know, I really care about you. And I've noticed there's a difference between a conductor who is conducting the music in their head and sort of like looking over the student's head and a conductor that really looks into your eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that interesting? Some people kind of like just look at the group or the sea of clarinets as an example. <laughs> but the conductor who makes that individual connection even just with the eyes, it makes a significant difference. And, you know, where our heart goes, energy flows. So even our body language communicates so much. You know, are we giving our full self to our students? When students walk into our office, does our body language communicate that they're being a nuisance? Right. We're at a computer <laughs> like, yes. Or do we say, you know what? You're the most important person in the room because you came. We set it down and we turn our chair and we say, you know, how can I help? Mm -hmm. That sends such a powerful message. Sometimes we we have no idea how powerful those messages are. are. Yeah. And when when students feel that from you, again, it's just it's more of that that belonging sense that they're they're meant to be there, yeah. that they want to be there. Yeah. And I find that how we treat students becomes contagious. Mm -hmm. And this is this is how we treat each other in our class. Uh, a friend of mine, Cameron Jenkins. Uh, he's, he lives in Mississippi and, and I actually quoted him in my book. He said, culture is what you allow. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about that. Wow, that was really powerful because we can say one thing about maybe respect's important in our classroom, but the minute we start to just let a little bit get away with it, where it's, there's some disrespect, we've now said, well, actually, we don't really mean what we say and disrespect is okay in our culture. Or mm -hmm. maybe we begin to bring our sarcasm into the classroom, which by the way, I really do my best to um, eliminate sarcasm because sarcasm can always be misinterpreted. Yeah. And so if sarcasm becomes like our modus operandi, then sarcasm becomes part of the culture, yeah. which is always there's little digs and mm -hmm. you never know how you could be hurting a, a young person with, mm -hmm. with sarcasm. So I, I'm just leery of that and just always try to bring this uplifting supportive aspect to my classroom. That doesn't mean that we don't identify what needs to be fixed. Right. Yeah. But, but we do it from a caring place, a supportive place that offers solutions. 
Yeah. So is there is there anything that we haven't asked you that we should have? I'm trying to think <laughs> <laughs> about this about this topic. I mean, there's probably so much we could be here all week, but <laughs> is there any like last tidbits you want to leave people with? Sure. Well, you know, we've talked a lot today about empowering our students and listening to them and giving voice to our students. And uh, what's a perfect or what's a part of Upbeat, I should say, is that it begins with us as the teacher. Mm-hmm. It begins with us as the teacher. And I know oftentimes leadership, we focus on others and that is so important, but leadership really comes from within. And that's why part one in the book, Ignite, focuses completely on the teacher, about how we can choose our upbeat. Every day is an opportunity to choose our personal upbeat, right? Which is which is our attitude that we bring to any situation, that we can choose our response and that we can choose to focus on what we get to do rather than what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And so my message would be to, you know, take care of yourself. Be aware that you have more control and freedom than you often realize that you do get to choose what you focus on. And you can set your intention when you walk into that classroom and say, today, I'm going to share my appreciation with students. Today, I'm going to focus more on what's going well than what's going wrong. Today, I'm going to celebrate the students so they leave my classroom feeling great about themselves. Today, I'm going to bring my whole self to the classroom and I'm going to open up and be vulnerable if the situation calls for it so that my students feel safe and supported when they're vulnerable and expressive. So I believe that leadership comes from within, that leadership can be learned, leadership can be taught, and that every day is a new opportunity to write our story and to create the the classroom that's supportive, compassionate, engaging, and empowering for our students. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if people wanted to connect with you and learn more about your work, how could they do that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the easiest way is to go to my website, upbeatglobal.com, where you'll find lots of resources for teachers and students uh, on topics of mindfulness, mindset, culture, and leadership. And uh, I encourage folks to, to check out my book, Upbeat. Yes. And you can you can find Upbeat through GIA publications. You can also access it directly from my website and read even more about the book at the website, which is which is a lot of fun to do. Or else, of course, you can find out on Amazon. And for those ebook readers, you can find it on Kindle. And awesome. in the future, it'll be on audiobook, uh, which, is, which is still recording. So it'll be on Audible down the line. So look forward to that. Uh, go ahead and subscribe uh, for, for my newsletter, free newsletter from upbeatglobal.com. And, uh, you know, oftentimes I'll have articles written um, for SBO magazine. Uh, we're actually starting a monthly leadership column that I'll be writing. So every month, look for for articles, and and I write regularly for Smart Music and Band World magazines too. So, all sorts of ways to connect, and I love working with students, uh, whole music departments. I do a lot of professional development uh, for school districts, whether it's all fine arts or the entire staff or or just the music department. And I love working with elementary students. I do all school assemblies for elementary, middle school students, and high school. So there's so many ways we can collaborate. And uh, please do reach out. And Matthew at UpbeatGlobal.com is my email. Awesome. Well, we will also say, yes, definitely go out and get his book (laughs) because Catherine and I have both enjoyed it. So thank you so much for being here today, for taking the time. Um, We really appreciate it and just love the conversation. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's been fabulous. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We'd also love for you to consider sharing this podcast with a friend and leaving a positive review. That's one of the best ways to get this message to new listeners.